we read that John the Baptist, his primary message was, as described in Matthew 3 verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was the last of the prophets to the nation of Israel. He was the forerunner for Jesus Christ, who was going to open up the way to a new covenant that God was making with man, which would bring people of all nations into a relationship with God as their father. And so he, his message to the nation of Israel was repent. And repent means turn around. The best definition of it could be from the military turn, military command about turn. When a soldier is facing front and the sergeant major or havildar major in the parade ground says about turn, he turns right around and he puts his back to the direction he was facing and looks in the direction to which his back was facing formerly. That is the best definition of repent, to turn around. And we have to turn around in our mind. In, in English, the word repent doesn't express it as clearly. In most languages, the translation of repent is not very clear, but in the Tamil language, it's very clear. Repent is mananthirimbal, that means the turning of the mind. That's exactly what it means, an about turn of the mind. And that's what John the Baptist was telling the nation of Israel. See, the nation of Israel was promised a whole lot of earthly things. Throughout the Old Covenant, there's no promise that they could partake of the divine nature. There was no promise of treasure in heaven. There was no promise about a heavenly life on earth, etc. It was all earthly. They were promised material wealth, and especially in Deuteronomy 28, it's very clear. Material prosperity, physical health, number of children, their business would be blessed, their farming would be blessed, their cattle would be blessed. That was the job in those days of the Israelis. And they would be very prosperous, they would never be in debt, and their earthly enemies would all be destroyed. They'd be a great nation. And they would have a land, which is the land of Canaan, which was called Israel. So all the blessings were earthly. And their face was completely set towards the things of earth all the time. And John the Baptist came along and said, turn around now, about turn from this, stop facing the things of earth and turn around because now a new kingdom is coming. That is the kingdom of heaven where earthly needs become secondary. Even physical health becomes secondary. Material prosperity becomes unimportant because God provides us with material necessities and turn around and now God's going to give you spiritual wealth, heavenly wealth. God's going to give you spiritual children, not necessarily physical children. And you'll have a, a spiritual heavenly land to possess, not an earthly land primarily. So turn around, he was telling them, because the kingdom of heaven has not yet come. It is near, at hand. It was going to come on the day of Pentecost. Now we read in Matthew 4, verse 12, that John was taken prisoner by Herod. And when Jesus heard this, <clears throat> he withdrew from Galilee and he left Nazareth where he had grown up and lived for 30 years. And he came and took a house in Capernaum, which is beside the sea. And then he began to preach from that moment onwards exactly the same message that John the Baptist had preached. Repent, Matthew 4, 17, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John, as it were, had run the first leg of the relay race and handed over the baton to Jesus. And he took it up. And the same message, repent. When Jesus ascended up into heaven, we read that the apostle Peter took up the baton then from Jesus' hand and preached the same message. Repent, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. He preached to the people on the day of Pentecost, Repent and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the kingdom of God within us. Now it had come. John the Baptist and Jesus had only said it was going to come. It's at hand, it's near. 
Once Jesus said the kingdom of God is in your midst, referring to the fact that in Christ, the kingdom of God was already present, but it wasn't present in the people around him. That would happen only on the day of Pentecost when those 120 who were waiting for the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God came and filled them, the kingdom of God came within them. And then that is the kingdom they proclaim, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, which is not physical healing, it's not material prosperity, as unfortunately is being preached by a lot of Christian preachers today. That is a deception. Let me tell you plainly, that is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, we read in Romans 14 and verse 17, what Matthew calls the kingdom of heaven is called the kingdom of God in the other gospels. For example, when John the Baptist preached that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the same thing is quoted in the other gospels as John the Baptist preaching in the kingdom of God is at hand. Mark chapter 1 verse 15. You compare Mark chapter 1 verse 15 where John the Baptist is quoted as saying the kingdom of God is at hand and so repent. With Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2 where he says repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and it becomes clear as crystal that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same thing. Though some Christians try to make a distinction between them because they haven't studied the scripture properly. So the kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven. What is it? In Romans 14 and verse 17, it says the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not anything earthly. It's not prosperity. It's not healing. It's not earthly blessing at all. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven. And it's primarily righteousness. The righteousness of God himself. First imputed to us when we receive Christ as our Savior and Lord and then imparted to us from within by the Holy Spirit where the righteousness of God becomes manifest in our life and peace, an inward peace primarily given by the Holy Spirit, freedom from anxiety, fear, tension, discouragement, gloom, bad moods, etc. And an outward peace with all men where we refuse to fight with people for anything. And joy, an inward joy that delivers us completely from discouragement and depression in the Holy Spirit. So this is the kingdom of God. It's an inward thing. The kingdom of God is within us. It's the life of Christ coming within through the Holy Spirit. This is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of heaven. It's the life of heaven here on this earth inside our hearts. And that's what Jesus was preaching. It's the very first message he preached. Repent. In the Matthew's Gospel, that's what we read. It's the very first thing that he preached. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is near. And this is what has already come on the day of Pentecost and that we should be now proclaiming as not as something that is near, but something that's already come. In fact, Jesus made that clear in Mark's Gospel. In the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus was speaking to some of the people, he said to them in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, he said to the people standing in front of him, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here, not all, but some, who will not die until they see the kingdom of God come with power. So some of you standing here, he said, would die before that day. But there are some standing here who will not die. There were old people there and younger people there. And he was saying that some of you will not die till you see the kingdom of God come with power. Now obviously that's not referring to the second coming of Christ when the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. No, that day is in the future. And there's nobody who heard Jesus speak there who's alive today. So he's not referring to that. He's referring to something else that would happen in the lifetime of some of those people standing in front of him when they would see the kingdom of God, which they hadn't seen till now, till then, which no one on earth had seen till then. When did that kingdom of God that Jesus referred to here come with power? The answer is in that word power. Jesus used that word power again before he ascended into heaven. 
He told his disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And 10 days later, we read, they did receive that power. And that was the fulfillment of Mark 9 verse 1. Some of the people who heard Jesus had died before the day of Pentecost. But some others who were standing there were alive when the kingdom of God had come to earth on the day of Pentecost. So when we compare scripture with scripture, we find this is the kingdom of God that we are to proclaim. And Jesus said, especially in relation to the last days, in Matthew 24, in, when the disciples asked him about the second coming, he said, one of the things he said was, in Matthew 24 and verse 14, the question they asked was, uh, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Matthew 24, verse 3. And he said many things. And one of the things he said was in verse 14 of Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom. What is this gospel of the kingdom? Now, many of us have heard a gospel of the forgiveness of our past sins and praise God for that. What about this gospel of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God on earth in people's hearts, the kingdom of heaven, heaven coming and dwelling in people's hearts. This is going to be preached in the whole world. Not that the whole world will receive it, very few will probably receive it, maybe only one or two percent. But it will be preached for a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. I'm greatly encouraged by that. That before Christ comes, there's going to be a proclamation of this gospel of the kingdom. What is that? We saw in Romans 14, 17, a gospel of righteousness in the Holy Spirit, peace in the Holy Spirit, joy in the Holy Spirit. There are very few proclaiming it. Most people are still proclaiming only the forgiveness of sins, which is a very good first step. To me, it's like the cleaning of the cup. If my little boy comes to me and says, Daddy, can you give me a glass of milk? And he gives me a dirty cup, a picture of our hearts. What I do first is clean the cup. I wouldn't pour milk into that dirty cup. I would take that cup and clean it thoroughly. And then, what's the purpose of that? I don't give him an empty cup after that. I fill it with milk and then give it to him. So when we come to Christ, the first thing he does is clean up our hearts. Like clean the inside of the cup. And does he leave it like that? No. He fills it with what? With the righteousness of God, the peace of God, and the joy of God through the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel. And if we only offer the truth that Christ will clean up the heart, clean up the cup, we are offering people an empty cup. And that's why so many Christians are thirsty. They're not satisfied because they're going around with this empty cup, which may be clean, but it's empty. What's the use giving my son an empty cup that's clean? Saying, son, you gave me a dirty cup, here it is clean. Is that all God gives us? That'll be frustrating. My son will say, hey, dad, I wanted some milk. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? The trouble is that a lot of Christians are not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And that's why they go around with a clean, empty cup. 